Hello and welcome to the eighth presentation in this series on eco-modernism. Today I'll be talking about food and drink and about how the things we eat affect the world in which we live. Obviously this is going to be an emotive topic because we all eat food and we all love food. So if someone suggests that we might need to change the things we eat, the natural reaction is always to push back. But this series of presentations is not about me delivering moral arguments for or against some kind of lifestyle. All I want to do is talk about how the choices we make affect the environment we all share. If we accept that we ought to live in a way that best supports the world we live in, then there are a few factually correct statements we can make about the best way to achieve that. Obviously some will choose to ignore it, or perhaps take it to extremes, but without the information it's impossible to make an informed decision. But that decision is of course up to us. In this presentation we'll learn about the environmental impact of various diets and the techniques that are used to grow and supply those food items to our dinner tables. And the conclusions I make are not necessarily the ones you think I'm going to make. So let's dive into the facts and figures and then later we can work out what we're going to do about it. The first thing to realise about our diets is that we, by which I mean the overwhelming majority of people listening to this presentation, are the lucky ones. If you have a device capable of streaming videos from YouTube, then you're probably able to afford enough food to fulfil your daily calorific requirement. That is, you don't live in food scarcity. But many people in the world today are not so lucky. And here is, simultaneously, one of the most encouraging statistics that you will ever hear today, and also one of the most alarming. The number of people living in extreme poverty worldwide has plummeted from roughly 2 billion in 1990 to something like 600 million today, essentially eradicating that condition from everywhere except sub-Saharan Africa. And this was during a period when the total population of the world rose by more than 2 extra billion. This reduction in extreme poverty globally has been an incredible success story. But it is also alarming because with more people, richer people, comes a greater appetite for food. Not just small quantities of sustainable subsistence farming, but large-scale agriculture. And those appetites move from the bare minimum food required to remain alive, simple grains and vegetables, to exotic fruits, processed foods and lots more meat. Meat production, which we'll talk about later, has increased from 71 million tonnes in 1961 to around 350 million tonnes today. That's an increase of almost five times. And that number is increasing rapidly. To meet a growing population, expected to reach well over 9 billion by 2050, and with an increased appetite for a rich world diet, food production globally will need to increase by roughly 50% from its current levels. But here comes the problem. We're producing near the maximum we can sustain with modern farming methods already, and food production is responsible for over one quarter of our world's greenhouse gas emissions. Clearly this is a huge problem. So let's address the issues in turn. First of all, why can't food production expand to meet the increased demand? The world is a very large place. So when I say, as I'm about to, that we've run out of land, it seems like a joke. After all, there are vast tracts of empty land that we could use for a growing human population, with no human being for hundreds of miles. So what am I talking about? The distinction here is that we're running out of arable land, that is, good land that we can use to grow crops. The amount of arable land we use per person is indeed shrinking, with modern agricultural methods able to squeeze ever more out of our increasingly overworked soil. But the population of the earth is increasing much faster than the efficiency of agriculture, and with increased diets of historically impoverished countries, we're not able to meet the increased demand with increased productivity not without some startling new scientific breakthroughs, of which more later. So how much land do we have? Well, the Earth has 13.4 billion hectares of land available. A good chunk of that is entirely barren, or covered with glaciers, hidden under cities or other built-up areas or roads, or covered by freshwater, such as lakes and rivers. So we can remove all of that. That leaves us with roughly two-thirds of the total land area left. Well, human civilizations arise in areas where they can be sustained, so pretty much all the areas suitable for growing crops already have human civilization and dense agriculture nearby. 
We're using a little over a third of all possible arable land for farming already, but it's by far and away the best third. Most of the rest is either very poor quality or covered with forests or marshes or jungles and other protected environments. Think about Australia, for example. It's a vast continent, but the only bits where farming can realistically happen are the bits where it currently does happen, in a tiny slither around the edge of the continent. The vast majority of that continent is extremely poor soil, mountains, marshes, deserts or shrubland. And what about the remaining land that's not poor quality? Well, most of it's covered with forests. Sure, we could bulldoze the Amazon rainforest to grow more wheat, but that goes fairly heavily against the whole environmentally friendly motivation. The bottom line is that there is more or less zero extra good quality arable land in Europe or North America that can be productively farmed. There's quite a bit in sub-Saharan Africa and South America, but it's mostly jungle and tropical rainforest, which are vital ecosystems not just for a wide diversity of animal and plant life, but also for absorbing carbon dioxide from the air and regulating weather patterns. And it gets worse. The total available arable land is disappearing, partly due to the effects of climate change reducing rainfall across large swathes of the planet, but also partly because of over-farming, denuding the land entirely. The short summary of this section is fairly clear. We cannot feed the world in 2050 at current Western styles of living with today's technology. Something has to change. Either we change what we eat, or we invent new technologies to be more productive with the space we have. Those of us who are health conscious might be grappling with competing moral demands when it comes to fish. We've been told for decades that oily fish are very good for us and that we should eat at least one portion per week. But we also know that overfishing is a very serious threat to our oceans and that fish stocks are dwindling to alarmingly low levels in many areas. Fish are amongst the most threatened group of living creatures on our planet, as this chart from Our World in Data shows. And this chart shows what fraction of fish stocks are overexploited. Globally, it's over one-third of our fish stocks being killed at such a rate that they won't exist for much longer. Our oceans contain so much life and are so vital for our planet that this is a real tragedy. North Atlantic cod and haddock are so badly depleted that there are barely enough left to be worth searching for. Scientists estimate that the number of adult cod 12 years old or older, roughly half the usual adult lifespan, is probably only a few hundred in the entire North Sea. Pacific bluefin tuna are down to 2.6% of their historical levels. There are two takeaways from this, and the first is obvious. There are some fish that we simply should never buy. To some extent, we can rely on our governments stepping in and prohibiting the sale of fish from endangered populations, but not always. It's best to do your own research. But the second thing we could do is look for alternatives to fish harvested by giant industrial fishing vessels. That could be locally line-caught fish, which is likely to be more expensive, but at least guarantees there is no overfishing of vulnerable deep-sea stocks. Or alternatively, we could look to alternate ways of growing fish entirely. Why can't we farm fish just like we farm other livestock? The answer is, of course, that we can, and we do, in huge numbers. In fact, we now eat more farmed fish than wild fish. But farmed fish are not without their issues. For a start, what do you feed them? The answer is usually more fish. There are also concerns around the welfare of the fish farmed in densities far beyond what they would experience in nature and the propensity for disease, just like we've discovered for humans packed together in cities over the last two years. Farmed fish help protect the stocks of endangered wild fish of some species, but until we find ways to grow them in more sanitary conditions and fed on a more sustainable diet, they don't provide a complete solution to the challenges that the world will face over the coming decades. They also don't provide a solution to those who don't want to or cannot eat fish. So what other kinds of food can we look at? When it comes to food and the environment, the one main question that most people dread is this. Do I have to become a vegan? The very thought of a plant-based diet is wholly off-putting to a lot of people, partly due to the perceived pain of giving up delicious meat, but, to be honest, largely because veganism has historically been associated with a certain level of moral preachiness that tends to anger rather than persuade. 
So here's the first thing I'm going to say here. I'm not a vegan myself. In fact, I still eat meat. But I have definitely cut down my intake of meat drastically. And I do think that by the end of this century, most people on Earth will be eating a primarily plant-based diet. And I think that's probably necessary. There are two general reasons why people alter the amount of meat in their diets. The first is based on a deep moral or religious conviction. Usually this means that meat, and possibly dairy, must be removed from the diet entirely, and even a tiny speck of meat in a meal contaminates it beyond redemption. However, the second reason why anyone might want to alter their diet is a more pragmatic one. We want to get more of something or less of something, or we want to tweak what we eat to suit our preferences. The difference between being a strict religious vegan or merely cutting down on animal products seems very large to the vegan, I'm sure, but in terms of your impact on the environment, it's actually not a huge difference. If you eat a steak every day and then cut that down to once per week, you've reduced your red meat intake by over 80%, and consequently your CO2 emissions have significantly dropped. You're still eating meat, but maybe not quite so often. Similarly, swapping out red meat, such as beef or lamb, for white meat, like chicken, will also hugely reduce your carbon impact. Our world in data is excellent here, as always. This chart shows the total greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food for a range of common food types. Beef and lamb are the worst offenders overall, as I'm sure you know. Other meats like pork and chicken are significantly less damaging. Switching most of your beef meals for chicken would reduce your meat-related environmental impact for those meals by roughly 10 times. That's huge. And you can still keep eating meat this way. Of course, if you also swap out a few meat-based meals for plant-based meals, then you reduce your impact still further. But it's not just meats that are bad. Given that most milk comes from cows, it's hardly surprising that cheese also has a big environmental impact. Chocolate and coffee, though, are high up on the list too. That's partly because they require a lot of processing and transport, but also partly because they tend to be associated with deforestation in the regions where they're grown. So not all plants are safe for the environment, a fact that vegans should definitely bear in mind, though these two are definitely outliers. Also, note that these figures show the amount of greenhouse gas emissions required to produce one kilogram of food, and whereas a decent-sized steak could easily reach, say, half a kilo, you're unlikely to eat that much chocolate in one sitting or get through half a kilo of coffee with your meals. Or at least, if you do that regularly, then you'll soon have other things to worry about. So I think the takeaway here is that we don't have to cut out meat entirely. Of course, if we do, that will minimise our greenhouse gas emissions. But we can cut them down significantly by swapping out red meat for white meat and maybe cutting out a few meat meals entirely. Right, so this is the bit where I make a lot of people angry who have so far been entirely on my side. It's not personal, I assure you, but it is based on good science and facts. And here's a conclusion that will do it. Organic farming is a bad thing for the earth and a bad thing for humanity. I'm not talking about individual people deciding not to use pesticides in their back gardens. That's not going to harm anyone, it's perfectly fine. What I'm talking about is the suggestion that we should move to a farming system that does not use any synthetic herbicides, pesticides or fertilisers and that entirely rejects genetically modified organisms. That's a really bad idea and cannot possibly provide enough food even for our current diets, let alone the 50% increase in production that we'll need over the next three decades. The organic food industry is worth roughly a quarter of a trillion dollars, with trillion with a T. So it's hardly surprising that they've got the resources to pull off such a masterpiece in misinformation, that most people believe a number of claims about organic food that are literally the opposite of the truth. I'll put forward a few facts that help me to advance this argument. Firstly, this article in Nature highlights the fact that organic food production uses 40% more land than conventional farming techniques to grow the exact same amount of food. It depends on the crop, sometimes it's more. Organic dairy farming, for example, uses twice as much land as a regular dairy farm producing the same output. Clearly this is a problem. We don't have an extra 40% more arable land on the planet without bulldozing rainforests, as we've already seen. So there is literally no way we can supply the world's current food requirements using purely organically grown food. More importantly, although organic farms will produce less CO2 per acre, they produce fewer crops per acre too, 
The Nature study I referenced earlier showed that were the UK to change all its agriculture to organic, then it would rely much more heavily on overseas imports to produce the volume of food required by the UK market and to make up that shortfall. And that would overall increase the greenhouse gas emissions of the entire process. This report, commissioned by the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, looked into the question of organic food and came to the conclusion that organic food has a land burden up to, in some cases, 200% more than that of conventional agriculture, and never less. What about pesticides? Well, the first misconception here is that organic foods don't use pesticides, but of course they often do. Organic food certification merely constrains the list of pesticides that are acceptable to purely natural chemicals. The word natural is not easy to define. After all, most of the worst toxins known to mankind are natural. Uranium's natural, plutonium, anthrax, cyanide, they're all perfectly natural. So-called natural organic pesticides include copper sulphate, which is produced industrially by treating copper metal with hot concentrated sulfuric acid. Moreover, our food in the 21st century is highly unnatural. The crops we see today bear almost zero relation to their natural ancestors before human crop breeders started their work. Processed foods like bread and pasta are highly unnatural. Natural is not a very relevant criterion, and it's certainly not a guarantee of safety. Finally, let's look at the issue of fertiliser. Organic food doesn't use conventional fertiliser, but it has to get the major nutrients that plants require into the soil somehow. Often this means nitrogen, and one way to get nitrogen into the soil is using crop rotations. So for some years you grow nitrogen-fixing plants such as peas and beans in a field to replenish the soil, as these leguminous plants take nitrogen out of the air and deposit it into the ground. But that, of course, reduces the amount of time in which you're growing the big cereal crops that we actually rely on. Alternatively, you could rely on manure from animal farming to replenish the soil, but there's nowhere near enough of that even now to cover all the arable land on Earth. And if we're also moving to a world where we eat less meat, then there'll be far less of it available in future. Also, being less nutrient-dense than conventional industrial fertilisers, it takes a lot more energy to transport manure from the site of uh, production to the destination fields. Why else might we want to eat organic food? Well, most people believe that it's healthier, but is it? Nope, sorry. Studies repeatedly show that there are no significant health benefits for organic food compared to conventionally grown produce. What about the levels of nutrients? No, sorry, no difference there either. What about pesticide residue? Well, organic foods, especially those that use no pesticides, obviously have lower residue, but the controls for these in conventionally produced farms are extremely tight and allowed levels are minuscule and provably harmless, as the study we just saw proved. So, are there any other arguments to support organic food? Well, one argument might be that, despite the lower efficiency of organic agriculture, we should still convert to it anyway because we could still feed everyone organically if we all turned significantly or entirely vegan. And yes, that's clearly true, because plant-based foods take significantly less land to produce than animal-based foods. It's true, but it's also irrelevant, because this isn't going to happen. I know a lot of people want it to happen, I also want it to happen, and it would be a good thing if it did happen. But it won't happen. Zero chance. In fact, meat consumption globally, as we've shown, is going up significantly, and that trend shows no signs of reversing. As poorer people get more money, the one thing they inevitably want to do is eat more meat. We should never build plans for the future around a wish for something that's never going to happen. So maybe in 100 years, 200 years' time, all of humanity will be vegan. But remember, the climate crisis needs to be solved in the next decade, and the world's population is going to peak in 20 or 30 years. We need a solution on that timescale. The bottom line here is very clear. Organic food is not a viable solution for the overwhelming majority of the world's food production, and it never will be, at least not this century. I mentioned genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, in the previous section on organic foods. The organic movement is strictly opposed to GMOs, and most people therefore assume that GMOs are a bad thing. 
but the data show that GMOs are not only not a bad thing, but in many cases they're vital. This isn't a presentation about genetic modification, that's the next one, but I do at least want to point out here something that, as far as I can see, is absolutely undeniable. The future will include more and more genetically modified crops, and without this technology, there's little hope for continued human flourishing. Sorry to anyone who thinks otherwise, but at this point I have to say that you're not looking at the data. We need genetically modified foods for a few very good reasons. Firstly, to protect against disease and reduce our reliance on fungicides. Secondly, to protect against pests and reduce our reliance on pesticides. Thirdly, to increase the nutritional content of foods. For example, to provide additional vitamins to populations where those nutrients are otherwise difficult to find. And finally, fourthly, to enhance crop productivity per acre, which, as we've seen, is vital due to the lack of extra arable land. Let's just look at the first of those in detail, protection against disease. I'll talk about the rest in a lot more detail in the next lecture. Our current monocultures are highly at risk of viral or fungal problems destroying entire crops. This is exactly what's happening with bananas right now. The same species of banana is grown almost everywhere because it's pretty much the only one that satisfies all the requirements for a globally traded fruit. It must be delicious, rapidly growing, as resistant as possible to pests and diseases, but also robust enough to transport. It must ripen at the correct rate. It shouldn't immediately spoil. This is a long list of requirements, and pretty much only the Cavendish banana matches them. All other banana species are unsuitable. The problem is that the Cavendish banana is now under threat globally by a fungus known as Panama disease, which is slowly destroying all the crops worldwide. This is, incidentally, the same fungus that wiped out the global production of the Gros Michel banana, which was the predecessor to the Cavendish. You don't see them anymore because they can't be grown on a commercial scale anymore. Given that all efforts to stall the progress of this devastating fungus have failed, there are only two remaining ways around the current problem, if we want to keep eating these delicious fruit. Either, firstly, we genetically engineer fungal resistance into the existing Cavendish or Gros Michel banana species, or, secondly, we engineer into an already resistant species some of the other traits that it might be missing, such as flavour, size or robustness. We could, of course, do this the old-fashioned way, which involves crossing endless thousands of plants and hoping that one of them just happens to satisfy our requirements due to the random nature of sexual reproduction and genetic mutation. Or we could use mutagenesis, that is bombarding plants with harmful radiation in the hope that this will trigger a greater rate of mutation and that one of those mutations might be beneficial. Sounds horrific? Yes, it is and incidentally it's totally permitted under organic food regulations, and has in fact been used to produce many of the totally organic plants that you eat today. Of course, if we were to use genetic modification, we wouldn't have to rely on bombarding seeds with radiation or just leaving it up to chance. Instead, we can just directly make the precise minute change we want and nothing else. But apparently that's a bad thing? As I said, more next time. This is clearly something I feel very strongly about. Well, this has been a contentious video, and it's almost certainly annoyed a lot of people. If it didn't annoy you, then that's great. But don't be complacent. Sometimes we go out looking for opinions that we agree with, but fail to do our due diligence and make sure that the sources we're finding actually care about the truth of their statements. Please take a look at the claims I'm making, and look at the available research, and make up your own mind about this. For those who were annoyed, if you're still listening, my advice is identical. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, food is an emotive topic, especially for those involved in the food industry whose jobs depend on a certain way of thinking continuing indefinitely. But all I ask you to do is to go back over the points I've made and look into them. Not everyone agrees with me, I'll admit that. Look up some different viewpoints and compare them. Bear in mind who's doing the arguing, and whether they have something to gain from arguing a certain way. Are they quoting scientific facts, or relying on emotion and anecdote? This really is the basis of a rigorous evidence-based life, 
Our goal here is to minimise damage to the environment while supporting the continued flourishing of the human species. There's not a single person on the planet who doesn't have to change at least a few of their cherished beliefs to do that. I've certainly been forced to change quite a few myself, kicking and screaming in many cases. But I believe that the most important virtue was to live an evidence-based life, and living a life that's as supportive of the environment as possible. And sometimes that involves changing my mind in uncomfortable ways. As they say, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. So, you know, maybe you should eat fewer omelettes? Or at least I think that's the moral of the story. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. I hope you continue to listen and join me on this journey through the world of eco-modernism. Next time we'll continue the discussion I started today about genetic engineering and expand it to more than just our ability to grow some food. I hope you join me then.